Good afternoon, dear all, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends and students. Uh, this is Dr. Anirudha Babar, Department of Political Science and Dot uh, Talks Coordinator. Welcome you once again in yet another exciting lecture in the Israel series. So today uh, we have uh, our expert with us, uh, Mr. Jyoti Ranjanji. And uh, he's now uh, going to continue with the Israel series. He will be delivering two more lectures in the coming days. So this is going to be the second lecture in the series. The first lecture we have already done. And now we are going to have uh, his talk on peace, operation, peace and operations in between competing narratives and compelling choices. And uh, we are really eager to listen to Mr. Jyoti Ranjan. Though our students, uh, I believe, uh, they are still coming. And uh, without wasting any time, since we really value the time that uh, Jyoti Ranjan Ji has given to us, without wasting any time, I request Jyoti Ranjan Ji to kindly please uh, take a charge of this virtual stage and please go ahead with the presentation. Meanwhile, our students and uh, faculty members will join to us. Thank you, sir. Please go ahead. All yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Anirudha, and thank you so much, Tetsu College, and all the staff and members and students. So we'll start our presentation straight away. I'm sharing my entire screen. Sure, sir. Yeah. Wait a second. Hmm. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, it's uh, slowly opening. Yeah, it's visible now. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So today we are going to discuss about the operations in between in the larger context of Arab-Israeli conflict. And today's lecture would be more in tune with Israel and Palestinian conflict. In the next lecture, we would go through the 67 war, 73 war, and the Israel-Lebanon wars and all those, we'll mention them in this lecture as well. And if some of us might recollect, in the previous lecture or the previous webinar, we had discussed Balfour Declaration in 1917, followed by Peel Commission, the White Paper and the UN Resolution that ultimately leads to the formation of Israel. So these are just legal, semi-legal documents. And we also realized how the destruction of state in the ancient times leads to the destruction of Jewish life and scattering of the people and the people of Israel, the Jews, ending up in diaspora for the next 2000 years. However, in the 20th century, what we see is that further destruction, total destruction, annihilation through Holocaust is followed by state formation in the land of Israel. So this is an observation. Um, I was expecting someone might have made it. And I show a small image now. This is known as the clover diagram, the clover map. It was made in 1581 and it shows the place of Israel in the ancient world as a, it is the place in the meeting point of Europe, Asia and Africa. It was prepared by Henrik Bunting. He was a German scholar as well as a priest. And yeah, so today's objectives, having said all that, is going to be limited to basically giving you a small introduction and opening so that anyone uh, who is listening to it is able to go ahead and carry on a dinner table talk or even able to carry forth a small conversation in the issues of Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the post-48 context. So before we go ahead and enter the political part, let us start with the geographical aspect. Dr. Anirudha, can you hear me and everything is visible? Yes, yes, everything is visible. Okay. I can hear you. It's clear. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is the map of Israel. It's like a thematic map of Israel showing us the topography. The blue mottled body that you see, this is the Dead Sea. It is not to scale. And the blue on the left, this is the Mediterranean Sea. Here is the city of Tel Aviv. These are the mountains of Judea and Samaria. Samaria in the north, Judea in the south. These are the hills of Hebron. And this, this here, somewhere here, we'll find Jerusalem where my cursor is. And in the north, if we go, here we can see the Golan Heights. And below it is the Sea of Galilee, Lake Kinneret. Here is Haifa, the Carmel Mountains. And here are the 
hills of Galilee, upper Galilee and further north if you go, we'll find Lebanon. On the eastern part, the tall mountains, these are the mountains of Jordan. And this valley between Judea Samaria and Jordanian mountains, connecting the Lake Galilee and Dead Sea, that's the Jordan River Valley. And further south, if you go below the Dead Sea, it's referred to as the Arawa Valley. Because this map and these geographical aspects will help us understand further, because today we'll be using a little bit of maps. So once 1948 goes ahead, Israel fights for its existence against the six neighboring Arab countries. And after that, what we see is that there's a resolution of 94 that, in, that calls for, this is passed in the United Nations General Assembly, it calls for the return of the refugees, giving them a sort of a right. It forms the bedrock upon which the UNRWA, United Nations Refugee Works Agency for the Palestinians is built. So United Nations has two refugee organizations. One is the UNHCR for covering all refugees in the world. And there's the UNRWA, UNRWA, which is specifically for the Palestinian people. And the Palestinians all are not just covered under UNRWA, some are also covered under UNHCR, but majority of them come under UNRWA. So UNRWA has its camps, facilities all over in West Bank. So this mount, the mountains you see, Judea and Samaria, they encompass much of the West Bank. So they have their camps, schools and everything in West Bank, in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Syria also, and in all those countries nearby where Palestinian refugees have gone. And today we'll also discuss about Resolution 242 and Resolution 338. These are images or should we say screenshots of the same. But before we go ahead, we need to talk about an important thing. So we are talking much of it from the Israeli perspective. This doesn't mean that we are discounting the Palestinian perspective. And there is a perspective such as Palestinian perspective, the Arab perspective, and it has an equal importance also. Uh, but our subject today is Israel and rest of everything else. We are considering that as the predicate. So Palestinians also fighting for their home and in politics and political science, uh, there are no heroes and villains, there are usually political actors and entities. And yeah, so it's important to understand. Maybe uh, it's also equally important to understand both perspectives. It is important so that we have a balanced perspective. But our time frame limits us. So the War of Independence in 48, as we had discussed in last class, there was a civil war. The civil war is followed by aggression from all sides from the neighboring Arab countries. As you can see the map on the left side, Israel is attacked from Syria in the northeast from the Golan side. It is attacked by Iraqi troops here in Beit Shean region. Jordanian troops also attack. And the Egyptians, the Saudis, and some all sides in 1948 war. And Israelis at first are not that confident of winning, but there are some factors that ensure that Israel wins. We must also understand that during this war, the Egyptian army was the largest army in, that took part, but it was more of a parade ground army. It had not seen that much combat. It had, it had engaged a lot of pageantry and marches and all that. But the most professional army, the army from which Israel really felt some degree of threat was the Jordanian Legion or the Jordanian army. And it was initially led by Club Pasha, a British officer at the top, and it had British officers leading the command. And as a result of the war, we also see that the one country that benefits it, apart from Israel, of course, is Jordan. It is able to capture much of West Bank and gets the holy sites of Jerusalem. It is able to get hold of all the Christian and Islamic sites, not just in Jerusalem, also nearby, such as Bethlehem and the monasteries in the Kidron Valley. And we go ahead, and on the right side, we see the modern map of Israel as Israel exists today. And it shows all the divisions or the provinces within Israel. It's for reference. And this map again shows us the moment. So, how does Israel win? Why does Israel win? To start with, Israel has a unified command, it has fresh volunteers. There is total mobilization of the entire population. Whereas on the Arab side, we see that sometimes they are fighting on counter purpose. 
because one army thinks that the other army might get to Jerusalem first. So even though they have been tasked to reach Tel Aviv, they change direction and uh, decide to take another course of action altogether. Also, many of these Arab states are insecure states because they have been facing recent threats. For instance, the Sheriff of Mecca, whose descendants have been able to get Jordan and Iraq, he has been removed from power in Saudi Arabia. Similarly, in Egypt also, King Farouk fears that he might be removed. The Iraqi government, which sends his armed few brigades, fears that it might get removed in a coup. What happens is that they reserve the best of the troops for internal security. And whatever they can dispense with, they are the ones that are sent. This is an important reason that we must understand. And also Israel has like, this is like a last chance for Israel. If they lose just once, throughout the history of Israel, if Israel loses once and it loses badly, that's enough because then Israel might cease to exist. Whereas other states, which are not only larger, but also enjoy strategic depth, they can fight on, they can lose territory and fight on. But Israel is so small. For instance, to give a comparison, it is Jersey. India, it is smaller than Meghalaya, but it is larger than Mizoram of that order. And many of the Palestinians are also misled that once you move away from the house, the Israeli army, the Arab armies that have surrounded Israel, they will take out Israel, they'll finish. But this doesn't happen. So the Palestinians who leave Israel are actually end up as refugees. And what happens in the aftermath, Israel has to face the dying attacks from 1948 to 55, mainly from Egypt, but also from in the, along the Jordanian border. And the Syrians who are standing right across the Golan Heights, if you see this map, they have the Golan Heights after 1948. They're able to engage in artillery shelling of the kibbutz in the north. Thus we see that Israel is fighting for survival even after winning the 1948 war. But Israel also deploys sleeper cells and helper groups and collaborators in the neighboring countries, especially Egypt, the case that we are going to see today. And the infiltrations that we talk about, 48 to 55, Israel soon realizes that if it doesn't ensure that there's a price to pay for such activities, this may go on. And to avoid that, Israel under Sharon creates Arya Sharon, then a soldier. Uh, they create a unit called Unit 101. And Unit 101 reads, leads several raids into the neighboring countries so that the Arab groups that are attacking, who are referred to as Fedayeen, they're able to attack the villages that support them. So that the villages know if you support the Fedayeen, there's a price to pay. The Kibya massacre, as it is referred to in the Arab world, was one of the bigger counter-attacks by Israel against the Fidain attacks. And then coming to 1958, we see the formation of Fatah. Now, Fatah's full form should, doesn't start with F, it starts with H. Harkat al-Tahrir al-Watani al But if we shorten and create an acronym, it will become Hataf. Hataf in Arabic would mean end. So you don't want to name your organization the end. You don't want it to end. So what they do is they write it in Arabic. So it is written from right to left. And then they take the first letter of each word from left. So it ends up as Fatah, which means in Arabic victory or conquest. And it's created by, led by this gentleman, you see, Yasser Arafat, and some of his friends. He was a civil engineer who had worked in Egypt and also had served in the Corps of Engineers of Egyptian army. But he then goes to work in Kuwait and there he forms this organization. But before that, while those Fedayeen attacks were going on from Egypt and all, and I told you about those secret sleeper cells of Israel, so they were controlled by the military intelligence. And there was one unit called Unit 131, uh, which, had, which was controlling a significant group. And they had even sent intelligence officers from Israel. The Israeli intelligence, military intelligence, is like the most important intelligence agency, and other intelligence agencies come or should we say, combine over it or provide information to it. And the Lavon effort takes place. What happens is that Israeli, in the Ministry of Defense, a plan is hatched to create some sabotage in Egypt so that the Europeans and the Americans think that the king, which, who has been deposed after that, now we have Nasser, who is ruling Egypt. The Nasser doesn't have control. And he shouldn't exactly be trusted with 
lot of sophisticated weapons and all that. And you see Moshe Dayan, Simon Perez, and this is Lavon. Initially, it's thought that these people, Lavon is the one who was scapegoated. But it doesn't know what this plan is. It is, in fact, Ghibli, Perez, and Moshe Dayan who kind of hatch it. And then one of the reasons this Lavan affair, it fails, the sabotages, saboteurs fail, is because one of the saboteurs, an intelligence officer by the name of Avriela, he kind of betrays them. Whether he does it on purpose or because of fears, we don't know. Because Israel censors this information all the way to 2005, when finally those people who come out of it, these people who escaped from, who were finally brought back, uh, they are able to, they are in fact awarded with medals and all. But back then, two of those saboteurs committed suicide, two were hung, and the rest of them were given sentences. This failure in Lavon affair took place because Israel miscalculated in some ways. And this was followed by the Suez Crisis in 1956. And the Suez Crisis leads to a situation where Israel is supposed to have the backing of UK and the French, uh, but they don't exactly pull through the bargain. Uh, Israel is supposed to attack the Suez Canal, and that is supposed to use as a ruse for United Kingdom and the French to come in. But United States intervenes and sees this as a colonial intervention of sorts. And so it is basically Israel that takes up all of the Sinai Peninsula, and United Kingdom and France are not exactly come to the rescue. In return, what happens is that the French give Israel with the initial nuclear technology because there's trust and the French had also promised them a lot of weaponries. For the much of the first 10, 12 years for Israel, the biggest superpower that supports it is not US, it is in fact France. France gives Israel its nuclear technology because of which Israel is able to develop several capabilities and come up with a Samson doctrine. The Samson doctrine says that should Israel be attacked from all sides again and it comes to the verge of destruction, it will take action. So the French connection here, but yeah, it's more French connection than the United Kingdom. The Suez crisis takes place. And yeah, this map is again for reference reasons. Again, you see this rift. This is in fact from the African Rift Valley. And the Dead Sea is at minus 400 meters. So yeah, and this side is Gaza. This is for reference. Yeah, this is the Northern Galilee. So for much of the post 1950s era, we come to this situation where Israel is protect, pro, projected as an entity that is threatening Palestine and all the Arab countries are kind of either intervening or pushing Palestine to go ahead. But what the Palestinian sides think is that sides in fact, because there's not one, there are several along with Fatah, they think that they are being used and they don't actually have the agency. And as we go, we see that we had discussed this in the previous lecture. And the reason I said the Palestinians don't think they have an agency is because they are not exactly the focus when the Arab sides are fighting. Arab Jordan fought and got the West Bank. Egypt got the Gaza Strip. And when all this happens, the Jordanians annex the West Bank. They don't declare a state for Palestine. And while the Egyptian side and uh, the larger umbrella of Arab League, does provide a figment of a state in Gaza Strip. Gaza Strip, for all matters, is controlled by Egypt. We come back then, coming to 67, uh, we see the Six Day War takes place, whereby Israel is threatened in a way because Israel detects changes in the Sinai Peninsula. Because, see, in 56, what happens is Israel captures the entire Sinai Peninsula, but then it moves back with assurances that, okay, there'll be peace and UN. UN sends its peacekeepers to guard the Sana Peninsula. By 67, Nasser removes these UN troops. This forms the ruse. This is like, how do you say? Now there's a Cassis belly and Israel knows that an attack is coming. So in 67, Israel takes the initiative and they understand that if they don't hit first, they might lose the war. So Israel, in fact, goes ahead, takes the first step in response to the preparations of its neighbors and conducts a surprise attack over Egypt and Syria and destroys the entire Egyptian air force. We'll discuss this in detail in the next lecture. And as Israel is a civilization we have discussed, 
Similarly, Islam, we could say, is also civilization. And we need to right now take into consideration the Muslim Brotherhood that has started in 1928. So in the Gaza Strip, Egypt has taken hold. There, the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt or the Muslim Brothers of Egypt, they start their local branch also. And for the Egyptian government, the Muslim Brothers are not seen in positive light because they are often seen as anti-government entities. And the Muslim Brothers kind of want a theocratic democratic system. And this is Hassan al-Banna on the right, the founder. And the reason I've discussed this now because these Muslim brothers would have a big impact on the overall Arab-Israeli conflict. Because in 67, when Nasser, who led the socialism in the Middle East and Syria, these are all Ba'athist, leftist countries. When they lost in 67 wars, the Muslim Brotherhood starts moving up because in the streets of in the Arab streets, it is believed that where the secular forces have failed, perhaps the religious ones might succeed. The below line, this is their motto. In 58, I will discuss how Fatah was formed. Coming to 64, several Palestinian organizations are brought together to form PLO. Now, PLO, which is formed in initial days, the Fatah of Yasser Arafat, doesn't isn't very confident about PLO. It is in fact suspicious about it, but it goes ahead with it. And after 67 war, what happens is that the Palestinian sides also lose some degree of faith and they take matters into their own hand. So this is the border of Israel from 49 to 67. All that's green. And on the left side is the post 67 border. All the orangish light brown area that you see, these are the regions that Israel captures in 67 war. And after that, what happens? Fatah is backed by Egypt now. They give them training and everything, but say that, see, when you attack Israel, you can't use our land. So they can't attack from Egypt. They instead attack from Jordan. <coughs> the 67 war, you see the victors, the Israeli side at the Mount of the Mount Dome. And the right side on the left, you see the Israeli soldiers resting near the wall, the Western Wall. So as we said, PLO takes charge, it's on the horse. But before it can do anything, the Arab League declares the three no's. The Arab League gets together in Cairo with Nasser as well. On the right, you can also see King Hussein and left the Saudis. And it says no peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, and no negotiations with Israel. So this is not good news for Israel because Israel thought now that we've got territory, we'd be able to exchange them for peace or maybe bargain or negotiate. But nothing of that thing happens. And because the, the Arab side doesn't, in fact, engage with Israel, the Egyptians go ahead with the war of attrition from 67 to 70. They, and even in the north, there is shelling from Syria. But the Syrians have lost the Golan Heights. And in the next lecture, we'll discuss how the war was mismanaged from the Arab side, which led to the loss. This was followed by the 73 Yom Kippur War, where Israel is surprised in a surprise attack. Israel, it seems, comes on the verge of losing the state, in fact. And Moshe Dayan says that perhaps we might lose the third temple, the third temple referring to the state of Israel itself. But Israel comes back and it's able to secure itself. Between this time, as we mentioned back then, how the Palestinians were attacking from Jordan and Egypt, mainly Jordan, because the Egyptians are the 20th In 68, yeah, the Battle of Karamit takes place. What happens is that because continuously the Fidayans under Fatah now, organized, are attacking into the West Bank, they're entering West Bank and then at, they go ahead and attack Israel major. What happens is that Israelis think we have to go and put a high price on our blood. And the Israelis go ahead into Karame and destroy the, this is the Palestinian camp, the training camp. Back then it would have been called a terror camp. And Israel is destroyed. But while the other constituents of PLO, they are running away, Fatah and the Yasser Arafat decides to stay put and fight. While they lose the war, the impression is that just because in 67, the Arabs lost doesn't mean that the Arabs are going to run away. The Arabs are going to stand and fight. Also, the Jordanian army joins in, and after the Israelis have achieved their goals, they withdraw back to the Israeli territories. But the word on the Arab street is, Fatah stood, PLO stood, and they fought. 
because of this pl and fatah get a lot of volunteers and a lot of people join in but things do are not rosy after this in 1970 one of the constituents of plo uh, one of the co communist constituents they hijack a plane and they bring it to a world war 2 era field a field in jordan called the dawson field and then they try to bargain it with the west and israel that we'll release the people the hostages and you should release our members this is seen as a blot on jordanian government because you don't have control over your country it seems and the jordanian king hussein takes charge and from 16 september to 27 september in response to this hijacking we see what's called referred to as the black september there's an offense to fight plo and drive them out out of jordanian borders the syrians try to intervene on behalf of the palestinians and they are backed by ussr as well but jordan with support of us and even covert support of israel is able to drive the palestinians out we see in this war israeli jets come into the rescue of the jordanians in the sense that when they see the syrian tanks are coming towards jordan and they have crossed idlib the israeli jets fly very close to the tank the syrian tanks to let them know that we are here and in the offensives whatever take place the syrians lose something like 130 tanks this is one of the tanks that the syrians lose and the jordanian soldiers are standing In the center, we see King George, King of Jordan, discussing with his commanders. One of the commanders back then was the future ruler of Pakistan, Zia ul Haq. He led one of the several operations against the Palestinians. Following this, what happens? The Palestinian, the Fatah, and the PLO, they relocate to Lebanon. And after that, another leftist organization, with it, which calls itself the Black September organization. goes and come goes ahead and commits the munich massacres and these are the israeli athletes who are killed in fact and this is one of the um, kidnappers or the terrorists if you may who is involved and all these terrorists in fact die but not before letting the world know the incompetence of the german side in handling the hostage situation because 11 israelis and one german police officer dies in this what happens is that because the previous olympics in mexico they were they had a strong military and security component the germans wanted to show that the 72 olympics is the free care free olympics and also they wanted to show it in contrast to the 1936 olympics that were held under the third reich nazi germany and they want so that this is more relaxed and freer better germany and they are lax when it comes to security in fact one of the situations that the security teams had before organizing the olympics had come across the 21st uh, scenario was that the israelis might be kidnapped or there might be hostage situation and israelis might die but the uh, german side doesn't invest too much in security and the result is the munich massacre but israel comes back it uh, launches the operation grapes of wrath and many of the perpetrators or the planners are in fact punished before after both 67 and the 73 wars the united nations comes with resolutions calling for israel's withdrawal from the territories that it has captured in 67 calls for peace and lowering of belligerents but this doesn't actually take into effect it doesn't actually happen in any way instead what we see is that the 194 resolution 194 which called for uh, bringing back the refugees that becomes the center stage on in the image that you see this is the balata refugee camp i've been there once and but when they say that all the refugees must come back if you look at it from 2020 or 2021 perspective today there are 6 million to 7 million palestinians in diaspora not all of them live in refugee camps there are some of them who are like heads of states such as president bukele of el salvador there are also rappers there are artists such as belly from canada so not it's not how do you say it's not homogeneous we can't paint them all in a broad stroke in 77 we see that by this time uh, nasser is dead anwar sadat has taken charge and he wants peace and he is in fact the leader when the century war takes place but having lost the war but how do we say it even lost because egypt didn't actually plan to get back entire sana peninsula in that war it wanted to get israel on the discussion table and in a way we can say egypt succeeded Sanwar Sadat visits Israel in 
This is followed by the 78 Camp David Accords, facilitated by US President Carter. And finally, in 79, we see that Egypt and Israel make peace. This is a big achievement for Egypt, for Israel, because Egypt was the largest army. It had big population. It had a agrarian backbone, and it could it was one of the countries that could keep on fighting Israel for a long time. But this peace ensures that the biggest threat in the radar of Israel is removed. Also during this time, the first Lebanon war takes place because, as I, as you mentioned, Fatah has moved from Jordan to Lebanon, and they continue with terror attacks into Israel. And there is a bus massacre in Haifa, where a bus is hijacked and several people are killed. And this keeps on repeating. So first the Israelis go in 78 into Lebanon. In 82, they again go in, and they go all the way to Beirut. And finally, there's a siege of Beirut, and PLO is compelled to leave Lebanon and move to Tunisia. On 6 June, in fact, in 1982, the Israeli troops had moved into Lebanon. And by 30th August, PLO had to leave Lebanon. Now, in 67, after Israel won the war, Israel annexed the East Jerusalem part. And it was, in a way, totally annexed, and nothing much was needed. But in 1980, they came up with a basic law which cemented Jerusalem as the unified capital of Israel. This faces opposition because while the parliament, the Knesset, backs this law, the UN doesn't like this. And it passes the resolution 478 opposing annexation of East Jerusalem and keeping Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. So this green part that you see, this is East Jerusalem. The red part, this used to be a UN monitoring campus, you can say. And the black dot, this is the old city of Jerusalem. The blue, this is the West Jerusalem that was with Israel. Till 1967, the green one was with Jordan. The blue parts were with Israel. And there was UN holding the ceasefire of 1948. After 67, Israel takes all of the East Jerusalem, annexes it. It also takes up all of the West Bank, but doesn't exactly annex it. What Israel does in West Bank is it creates a military rule under the COGAT, coordinator of government activities in the territories, and it doesn't annex it. What Israel's point of view is that we are not saying that West Bank is all of ours. We have an interest in the West Bank. Some of the territory we like to negotiate upon. And in the initial days, they wanted to negotiate with the King of Jordan. But coming to 1988, the King of Jordan divorces himself from the West Bank territory. And so there is no one basically claiming the West Bank and in terms of states. But the Palestinian sites, whose evolution we are mapping right now, they are the ones who claim a big stake in West Bank. And for them, East Jerusalem becomes non-negotiable. Because not only does it have this small old city, which is like the heart of Jerusalem, but it also has all these neighboring Arab neighborhoods, but because of a lot of settlement activities, many of these neighborhoods are today Jewish neighborhoods, like here we have Ramoth, and if you go north, there are more settlements also. But here, where I'm moving my cursor, there's the Mount of Olives. So you see, these are the settlements of Ramoth. The blue ones, these are the Israeli settlements in East Jerusalem. And the brown ones, these are the Arab settlements. And this is the old city I was mentioning. And within the old city, here is the Jewish quarter, and here is the Muslim quarter. There are four quarters, Christian, Muslim, Armenian, Jewish. And this part, this is the historical Temple Mount. This is the Alexa Mosque. This is the Temple Mount, and the entire compound is referred to as Haram al Shari. You see, now we have zoomed it. And the right side, you should be able to see the Getsemane. This is the Gethsemane, Garden of Gethsemane. And this is the Western Wall, where Jews pray today. Yeah, Al-Aqsa Mosque. Often there's confusion that the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque are the same or not, so no. Al-Aqsa Mosque is here. It has got a gray stone. And the Dome of the Rock has got a golden dome. And this is the Western Wall. Now, after 67, when Israel is able to get all this territory and in 73, nothing much changes, Israel is able to cement its control 
what happens is there is a lot of settler movement into West Bank, the West Bank that you see, and also into Sinai Peninsula till the time the Egyptian side and the Israeli side uh, come together and sign the peace treaty. There are settlements even there, even in Gaza. After 79, the settlements from Sinai Peninsula are withdrawn. In Gaza, goes ahead and they keep on building it. And this ultimately culminates into the first intifada. So by the time of first intifada in 87, what we see is that the PLO was first kicked to Jordan. From Jordan, it was kicked to Lebanon. Then it went into exile in Tunisia. It kind of loses control from the streets of West Bank. But because it loses control in a way, and there is a lot of Israeli activities, the people in general are very dissatisfied. During this period, also one more thing takes place. There is a growth of education in West Bank. Universities are created, such as the Birzeit and al Quds University. And the Palestinian population starts getting educated in the initial days. There is sudden rise of income by seven or eight times. In fact, 60-72 period, 1967-72, is considered the golden age of the settle of the if we are used. We, if we use the politically loaded term occupation, which is the Arab side uses. So because during this time, there is sudden increase of wealth, unemployment comes down to below 2%, and suddenly the Palestinians are like, they're finding new wealth, new society is being built. But as the educated youth come out of universities, they don't have jobs that can match their level. And in fact, many of them migrate to Gulf countries for jobs or to South America, or to US, Canada, Europe. Ultimately, the settlement, settler movement and several other factors, such as dissatisfaction of the educated, and also with education, many of those people who might have earlier been relegated as peasants, they're able to educate themselves. And many of the campuses became, become hotbeds of radical youth movements, leftist movements. And these are images from the first and the father. So the reasons why it happened that we discussed some of them. The Likud also came to power in 1977. And there's also a feeling that the Arab world has forgotten us because in the 80s, with the Iran-Iraq war, much of the focus of the world moves to Iran-Iraq war. During the Santifada, which begins in December 8, uh, we see that uh, there is also focus shifts from secular leadership to the religious leadership. And in fact, uh, one of the first sparks that leads to the Antifada is an event that happens uh, in Gaza. So this is the Gaza Strip. This is the map of Israel, Gaza Strip. So this is the satellite map of Gaza Strip. The yellow star that you see, this is the Erez crossing from Israel to Gaza Strip. In 87 and all, the people of Gaza back in the time have full access to the Israeli labor market, the Israeli industries, they can go to Israel and get a job, have a good salary, that they can come and then spend it in Gaza. Also Israelis, many of them have settlements here and there are also Israelis who just come there as tourists, enjoy the beach and go back. But of course, within the realms of the settlements. And in on December 8, what happens is that there's a truck that is moving towards the Eris crossing from Gaza and there are two, three cars, and there's an accident. The truck crashes the cars, and four people die. Three of those people are from this place, Jabalia. And because you see the proximity, it's so close. There is sudden uprising in Jabalia. And the people rise up, and they are fighting. They are throwing stones, because people from the villages die. And there's a theory that the Israelis have done this murder of the four people on purpose, because the previous day, an Israeli was stabbed in Gaza. So this is like revenge. So we are supposed to fight back because they have killed four of us. But later on, we, the Israeli judiciary comes to the conclusion that it was an accident. Now, as I said, the Fatah and the PLO were in exile in Tunisia. So who leads all these movements? It is led by the unified leadership of uprising. But this is not something as well organized as Fatah. What happens is that these are local level leaders who had initially got some taste of power in 76 when they had organized for the first time. And now 
this UN, UL, U, the ULNI, uh, the leadership of the Intifada, they are taking charge. But by 1988, the Fatah understands that if it wants to stay relevant, it must take charge. So it takes on the leadership of the Intifada that has started up pretty randomly and it kind of guides it. And because we mentioned that the religious sectors of the Arab, of the Palestinian society also come into the focus. Here we see the rise of Hamas. So, Mr. Dr. Aniruddha? Yes, Jyotiji. Yeah. So now we'll discuss about Hamas and all that in the context of uh, the first intifada. Uh, maybe we'll just take a one minute break. Okay. If it's possible. Yeah. So I'm just leaving the screen. We'll just take one minute break. Uh, I'll just grab my water bottle and have sure, a sip, sure, sure. and I'll recommend the same. <laughs> okay. Okay, sir. Thank yeah. You. Just give me no a problem. Second. No problem. No problem. Uh, since I is taking a break, I really uh, express uh, my gratitude and I'm really thankful to all of you for joining this wonderful uh, lecture series. So let me just remind all of you that this is the second lecture uh, in the Israel series. We have uh, planned uh, uh, to, to, to develop uh, uh, this series further, right? So there will be two or three more lectures and uh, I hope that uh, you will be interested in them as well. Uh, we will welcome you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. We'll, we'll start our lecture within a uh, few seconds, I guess. Am I audible now? Hello? Yes, 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 you are. Okay. You are. Okay. You are. Uh, my camera has kind of left me. Give me a second. Yeah, I must be visible now. Yes, you are. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So we see that the first Intifada starts and how does it exactly culminate? While it has local leadership and by 1988 the Fatah takes its leadership, something is happening in the background that the Israeli side is not taking due cognizance. Much later the Israeli intelligence sees this as one of its initial failures as well. So what happens is that Hamas rises. Now Hamas, if you might remember, I had mentioned 10, 20 slides ago, the Muslim Brotherhood. Hamas is the local branch of the Muslim Brotherhood in the Gaza Strip. The full form of Hamas is there, Harkat al muqamma al-Islamiyah. It is basically a theocratic system that they believe in. But does Hamas just suddenly come into existence in 87? Not so. So from 1978, there was a charity, an Islamic charity that starts functioning in the Gaza Strip, providing education, food to the poor, shelter to the poor. It is known as al mujama al-Islam. And there is certain belief in some quarters that in the early 80s, the Israeli government, the coordinator in the territories, and certain sectors of the Israeli government, in fact, supported this charity because they felt that they are doing a good job and also they wanted to undermine Fatah in some way. But once the Intifada starts, Hamas actually comes onto the stage from this charity. And many see that this was a mistake, having supported the charity that becomes Hamas ultimately. And what we also see is that uh, Hamas in its initial days is more radical. As we go down the line, we see that Hamas also is willing to talk and coordinate. Uh, Hamas, while it was supported in its writings and all by the Muslim Brothers, Muslim Brotherhood, the financial and the military support for much of the time till 2012, 2013, in fact, came from Iran. Now the word Intifada, it is the Arabic word for uprising or shake up. Alongside Hamas comes another organization called known as Palestinian Islamic Jihad. It is formed by also people who have originally members of Muslim Brothers. But there is something more important about which Palestinian Islamic Jihad. It is much more smaller than Hamas. It has less top down structure and it doesn't exactly engage in negotiation and talks. 
for instance when hamas today does something the israelis can put pressure on them it is very difficult to put pressure on palestinian islamic jihad because for one they have very few members they remain underground they can launch rockets they can do what they want and they think they can get away with it as well so the organization that disciplines palestinian islamic jihad is in fact hamas in a way today in the gaza strip just the way hamas might be a headache for fatah or the plo the pij is a headache for hamas in a way because let's say hamas signs a ceasefire and the pij doesn't respect that then israel will say well hamas you are responsible for any rocket that comes from gaza and we don't know whether it is you or page that is doing it we will retaliate this is the logo of hamas and this is the logo of page now during the gulf war the palestinian side led by fatah commits a mistake and perhaps it's because of frustration that the intifada is not going in the course or not giving them the right end that they want so the gulf war that takes place in 89 91 was the end of the cold war plo sides with saddam hussein what this happens is that the other gulf countries such as saudi arabia they oppose it and they in fact kick out a lot of the palestinian workers who are living and working in their countries and plo loses support because plo loses support israel is on in a weak ground is shaken because of the intifada the americans they come in and say see guys perhaps you might want to talk make peace and this is the important point i wanted to make that israeli side again it's much more nuanced they have made many mistakes as well and we are not talking about the palestinian side as much but if we are to do a discussion or lecture on the palestinian side i'm pretty sure it's going to be equally interesting they have their own perspectives as well so the americans come in and the secretary of state james baker in fact initiates this talk between the palestinian side and the israeli side what they want is that israel should come on to the discussion table and accept the plo at least as a representative of the palestinian people so that they can talk for peace because without talks what is going to happen is that both sides are going to keep on fight if not in direct conflict then in a protracted uh, low intensity conflict in which civilians are going to die in large numbers uh, israel is at first not so how do i say it doesn't take positively to the initiatives of the secretary of state baker so in one of the well televised speeches that baker gives he says that this is our phone number he in fact provides the phone number and tells his side whenever you want to come for peace call on this number he does that in front of cameras media captures into law and so thus there is a lot of pressure on israel as well as on the plo to come together to talk and there is the madrid conference in 1991 it also involves the other neighboring arab countries but not exactly much progress is happening here so there is side by side a track to deliberation between academics but also uh, i think i have made a small mistake here so in madrid conference one of the preconditions that the israeli side sets is that it won't talk to plo it doesn't budge so representatives are recruited from the west bank and gaza and they come and israel has to approve of it okay these are the people who are not linked with plo that much and we'll talk to them but the people they are usually academics as well and when they come and discuss with israel they don't even move a pin without instruction from plo so every morning they have discussion with the israeli side and in the evening they go back and report everything to yasser arafat who is sitting in tunisia so everybody understands that what the game is going on israel won't let plo on the discussion table and plo will ensure that it is the only team that gets to have a voice rather than some other so this leads to a very funny situation and the track to deliberation that's going on within oslo that in fact seems more promising progress is made there and the progress that is made uh it ultimately culminates into plo and israel coming on to the table and they talk in deep so this is the overall context in which all this is happening us has won the first gulf war soviet union is weak and because soviet union is weak it breaks up and lot of jews numbering more than a million they immigrate to israel now israel needs money and financial support to absorb all these immigrants and us puts a condition for the loans us says you will have to talk to the palestinian side 
if you want the money. So this is the statistic that shows the immigration of Russian speakers to Israel. And you see in 91, 90, the immigration is at its peak. So by 1993, Israeli site budgets, there's meet, the meetup in United States. And it's called Oslo because much of the deliberation for the last three years happened in Oslo. But this picture that you see under Bill Clinton, this is not Oslo, this is United States. Yet it's called Oslo 1. In 1993, it creates a stage, the basic agreements, based on which PLO is able to return to Israel, Palestine, that area. Yasser Arafat in 1994 comes back to Gaza, he's welcomed. This is an image of Yasser Arafat landing back in Palestine. And once the 1994 progress has been made, that PLO has been recognized as the voice of the Palestinian people, as the legitimate representative, what happens is that they move ahead and, and we have the Oslo 2 in 1995. This creates a separation of territories. The map that you see show is a result of the 1995 Oslo 2. In this map, if you see carefully, the West Bank, it seems is divided. So what Oslo 1 did was, it gave the Palestinian side Gaza and Jericho. In the image on the right side, you can see the Gaza Strip. This entire strip, except the white ones. The white ones were Israeli settlements. And the Jericho, this is given to the Palestinian side. They have full control there. And now there is discussion for the rest of the West Bank. So the Palestinian and Israeli side decide to trifurcate in, in a way into three regions, three zones. First is the area A, where the Palestinian side will not only have its government control, but will also have its own military control. Then there is area B. The area A in the left side map is basically the dark orange ones. And the area B is the yellowish, brownish ones. In area B, it's going to be Palestinian civilian control, government is, water, electricity, and all that. But when it came to security matters, there will be limited Palestinian police and basically Israeli military in area B and area C, which is much, which is like 60% of the West Bank, all the gray zones that you see, it is going to be under full Israeli control. And in fact, today, if you move through area C, you will see fluttering Israeli flags. And am I audible? Everything is visible? Everything is going well? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Go ahead. So, yeah. On the West Bank, on the left, you see there's Tulkarim and Kalkilia. Today, if you take a road, Along this, and Tulkaram and Kalkilia, this is area A. There's a road here. If you go by it, you'll see very big Palestinian flags flying. And you don't have to enter the West Bank. You just have to stay on the Israeli side. Just maybe you are going on a fun trip to the north. You are just zooming past this, and you can see the Palestinian flags and the Palestinian homes. And so in this way, there is a, I don't want to use the S word, but there is like a differentiation of territory. And there are also a lot of settlements. And much of these settlements are in fact in area C. The right side image shows you the settlements in the form of blue triangles. And the blue lines, these are the roads. They are often referred to as flyovers because let's say you're in Tel Aviv and you want to go to a settlement. You can just fly across the Palestinian territories and enter that. But yeah, these roads in the West Bank can also be used by the Palestinians. But there can be checkpoints if there is a suspicion of a terror act or something. So we come to this. The area A that the Palestinian side gets full control consists of 18% of the area and almost 90% of the population because it consists of all the urban areas. Area B has the orchards and villages. It has some population and it consists of 22% of the area. Area C is 60%. And much of the reason for this big 60% inflated number is the Jordan Valley that you see here. This is the Dead Sea. And this entire area is here. And Israel wants to retain this because then it can control the interaction of the Palestinian side with the outside world on a land basis. Why? Because if Israel doesn't control this area, then history shows us in 60s and 70s, Yasser Arafat and has, his folks had crossed and used this to perpetrate terrorism here 
attacks terrorism being a politically loaded term so they want to control this area so that in future even if let's say in jordan today there's a king in future let's say because of arab spring muslim brothers take power in jordan just the way they had done in egypt and when the muslim brothers are taking part in egypt israel was under a lot of fear because of stress because they felt that we have certain peace agreements with egypt what if the muslim brothers suddenly decide that they are going to abrogate all that by 94 there is also peace with jordan on the left side this is king hussein the warrior king and in fact yeah this king hussein that you are seeing right now i've shown you a picture of him a few slides earlier as well he was the one who was leading the well, the jordanian army in the black september the meeting with the palestinian with the jordanian commanders this is again him after the battle of karami same king this is him on the right side and he is there here again with us in 1994 signing the peace deal so he is seen as one of the survivors in middle east there were several attempts on his life but he has been very astute politically even when he lost territory in the former west bank he kept his calm and he has done what be what you might say is politically constructive smart wise being dispassionate and he has be he has taken a lot of good steps and today jordan is seen as one of the most stable countries and while it's not recognized as such it is a, a reason for middle east stability because even in syrian war the refugees moved to jordan palestinian israeli conflict the refugees moved to jordan isis and all that happened a lot of refugees again moved to jordan jordan is in a way like a sponge in middle east it absorbs stress it absorbs people and it also accepts funding and aid and support from us and european countries now what happens is after 1995 oslo 2 uh, yitzhak rabin the israeli leader is assassinated the israeli right wing takes power and once the right wing is in power uh, the palestinians are not sure whether they can go ahead and also there are a lot of there's a rise of terror attacks and there's kind of a uh, lowering of tempo when it comes to the peace talk but finally bill clinton is able to push and he gets the israelis and the palestinians to come to talks we have on the left ehud barak the israeli prime minister and on the right is yasser arafat and they finally come for the camp david talks in july 2000 but it doesn't go as per expectations nothing much comes out of it because yasser arafat feels that he has been trapped here he doesn't exactly trust bill clinton or ehud barak for that reason this is what he's offered ultimately there he's told that okay you will get the west bank but you'll have to give all these territories and when even when they talk about west bank israelis mean something and palestinians mean something else this is the west bank that rest of the world accepts that the palestinians want as their state right now but it wasn't always the case in 1948 67 uh, fatah pelo they were all seeking the destruction of israel as in all of tel aviv azalia netanya nazareth all of that they wanted all of that for themselves but with intifada and oslo one pelo accepts that israel has a right to existence and israel accepts that pelo is the representative of the palestinian people and that we'll talk and we'll have talks for the creation of a future palestinian state but what is going to be the nature of the state that is where the talks are stuck even today so this is this line that you see on the left you see a bulge this is the latrun bulge and the israeli side don't exactly think that this is part of west bank this is this is israel this is not part of west bank at all and this east jerusalem part israelis don't want to part with it the plo and the fatah they are very adamant that they want all of west bank and this is where it breaks down this is where the talks break, break down in and also there is talk of refugees that they want the return of all the refugees and the descendants as we showed in a previous slide 6 million to 7 million refugees palestinian in the palestinian diaspora what happens is finally yasser arafat comes back and we see the second intifada it starts around 28 september so there is 
I'll tell you three stories now. It is believed that uh, this is how it actually starts. On 27th, there were terror attacks going on, and on 27th September, a soldier is killed. And on 28th September, another police person is killed. This, you can say, has already started the Second Intifada because not only were crimes and all that taking place, now even government officers have been targeted. And on 28th September, Arya Sharon, with an entourage of right wing politicians, decides to go on the Temple Mount. I showed you the maps where I mentioned in the Garden of Ketsimani. So this is Arya Sharon along with the Israeli security. Now, before he goes there, the Israeli internal security, the inter -minister, Home Minister and the Home Ministry, they're equivalent of that. The Ministry of Interior and all, they check it, they see, okay, he can go. There won't be a threat or uprising. Person. This was their assessment. But they also are the Palestinian side and the British chief of the Palestinian Authority. We must understand that in Oslo too, when the Palestinians got that area, area A, area B, they also got a government there, an autonomous government called the Palestinian Authority. It had its own Ministry of Interior and Internal e Intelligence Agency. And the gentleman on the right, he was the one who headed it. In his assessment, he said, Arya Sharon can come. There won't be a disruption. You can come and do what you want, but you must not enter the mosque or the dome, golden dome. This is Jibril Rajab, and this is the logo of the Palestinian Preventive Security, the internal intelligence agency of Palestine. But not exactly things go happen. When Arya Sharon is there on top, nothing happens. But once it gets out, 1,500 men almost start throwing stones in different parts of the old city, East Jerusalem. And we see that there's violence. So while the Palestinian side says that this Arya Sharon who went there and he instigated and created this park, uh, it is more nuanced. In the coming days, what happens is that there is another incident, this time in Gaza. If you can see this, Dr. Anirudha, is it visible and all? Yes, yes, it is okay. visible. Yeah. Okay. So what happens in Gaza, there is this small military encampment. You see on the map on the left, in the Nezarim Junction. This is the Nezarim Junction. And this military outpost is being fired upon by the Palestinian, we can say, Israeli side would have referred to them as terrorists for sure. And the Israeli IDF soldiers are holed out here. And there is a father and son who are stuck here. I'll show you an image of the father and son. Give me a second. Okay. You can see there's this child lying down. This father and son, this image captures the imagination in the Arab streets. There is a that Nizarim junction that I showed you. This is where they are stuck. And the father and son the child somehow dies or it is that's what it appears to us and the word on the street is that the israeli side has killed a small child who was hiding with his father to escape the firing and the israeli side also is shocked because they then are very remorseful about it and they said that it appears that in the crossfire an israeli soldier might have shot the child but later on investigations show that it wasn't exactly that might have been the case there have been contending voices and if you want a link, I will perhaps maybe post a link to the same in our chat box. This is an Atlantic report. I will leave it for some of us who are interested in reading it.
Okay, I'm not able to do it right now, but yeah. And also, there are in the Arab world, a lot of stamps are released to commemorate this event. There are gardens and roads waved after the child. And as this goes on and goes ahead, we see that the second intifada has begun. The Tel Aviv Dolphinarium is bombed. Places in Jerusalem are bombed. And I'm showing you some pictures, but these are just few. In March, there's the Black March because in March, there are like 15 to 20 terror attacks, almost one a day. And then there was a major attack of Passover, the Passover massacre in Netanya. The second intifada, it seems, the, is the peak of violence in the Arab-Israeli conflict. And after Oslo, this was kind of unexpected. There are some repercussions of the same. We see that in 2000, as the, in response to the Palestinian activities and attacks and terror attacks, the Israelis increase more policing and security measures. As that increases, so does the attack in a way. And when attacks increase and Palestinian strikes, the Palestinian economy suffers. More Palestinians become unemployed, and these unemployed then go ahead and perpetuate further violence. So there's like a cyclical effect. The Arab side under Prince Saud, the Saudi crown prince back then, uh, the predecessor of current King Salman, he initiates the 2002 Arab peace with Beirut declaration, he's there. And, but not much comes out of it. Instead, Egypt, Israel goes ahead with Operation Defensive Shield in 2002. You see on the map, there are some major cities. These are all in area A. Please ignore Hebron here. The other cities that I mentioned here, Nablus, Jenin, Tulkarum, Kalkilia, Bethlehem, Ramallah. This is where the Israelis send in their troops in 2002 to break the back of the terror attacks. Because this is where many of the attackers are coming from. The effort is to destroy the terror networks. And this is in a way Israel's own version of war on terror. It is known as defensive shield. And the result is there's an immediate drop. And by 2005, is, Israel kind of has managed the second intifada and it is able to co cover its back. The, the lessons learned from the second intifada, Israel creates the Kafir Brigade which is like an urban warfare unit. There is far greater focus on urban warfare. This image on the down that you see, this is a world famous urban warfare training center that Israelis have built in the Negev desert. It's called Baladia, this one. It's like a village that's been built only for military training. Even some Indian troops go there and train in urban warfare. Even American troops go there. Germans also go there. It is here in map. If you just Google Baladia city, you will be able to see it. It was built with $45 million. Much of it came from United States. And on the map, this is how it appears. So 7.4 square mile training center. It was completed by 2005, 2006. And after that, we see that no more in the fathers have in fact taken place. So the Kafi Brigade is also being modified. And Israel today, in fact, I think last year and this year has started the formation of four more urban training centers aimed at Hezbollah in the north. And one of them has already been inaugurated. It's the north, it's known as Sneer, I think, yeah, Sneer. Near the Sneer uh, kibbutz, it is like three, four miles or 10 miles away from the Lebanese border. It is very close in the north. This is in the south. And alongside creating the specialized urban warfare forces, Israel also builds the wall. famous thing. There's a famous thing. You all might remember this, the wall. So this is not exactly a wall. This is a security barrier. It doesn't exactly follow the borders between West Bank and rest of Israel. You see, the red lines, this is the security barrier. The green line is in fact the internationally recognized border of West Bank. And throughout this red line, the wall doesn't look like this. The security barrier doesn't look like this exactly. It manifests itself in several ways. Sometimes it's look like, it looks like this. Sometimes it looks like this. Other times it is more wide and not so high. And sometimes it's directly in the line of contact in Gaza between the Gazan protesters and the Israeli IDF. 
the second intifada while it is controlled gaza keeps on rising back there's in the after the second intifada we see that there have been three gaza wars it, the wars have in fact gone ahead and taken place because once the israelis withdrew from gaza in 2005 because they removed all the settlements and they said gaza is no longer a part of israeli territory israel sees gaza as an enemy entity not even a state or anything an enemy entity and for israeli side the one people or the one entity that is supposed to have control over this gaza strip is the palestinian authority which is dominated by fatah and plo but in the 2007-8 elections hamas won those elections and but they were not even they couldn't get a chance at ruling west bank and the rest of palestine but they went over to gaza in a military cool like situation because there was delay in transferring power to them so they took power ever since they have been in power they have dominated the society and economy entirely and often there are rockets being launched from there whenever there is a large stock of rockets being launched onto israel it is responded with an operation and these are these operations are referred to as the gaza wars in 2008 9 there was the first one the operation castlet which took place for several weeks and then in 2012 there was a one week war the operation pillar of defense but the last one in 2014 which was a 50 day affair that was a massive one and this is the first gaza war 2008 9 operation castlet and here are the statistics for the last two this is the pillar of defense from 2012 and the 2014 operation protective edge you see that the protective edge showed israel what hamas is capable of but after 2014 there has been some relative peace because the hamas it wants to be seen as a respectable power broker an entity of relevance and if you go to any hamas press conference you would see that the hamas spokesperson are very immaculately dressed their vehicles even their forces they don't dress up like anything they will ensure that they are properly dressed for ceremonial purposes and all because they want to be seen as a state they want to be seen as relevant as respectable people who are capable of governing and also gaza is important because in 1948 when the palestinian side was fighting the few pretense of a palestinian state that took place in the arab world was in gaza under egyptian tutelage and here you see the image this is a palestinian passport that was produced in 48 50 that era when egypt was ruling gaza this has been explained but today we see that iran and hezbollah are the prime enemies and for israel fatah is more or less like a entity with which israel is like a frenemy they have to collaborate they have to cooperate for security reasons and fatah more or less has kind of given up on directly committing terror acts or any direct violence against israelis it might support the families of some terrorists through aid because they are citizens of pa but in the west bank there are these checkpoints that become points of contention coming to 2022 the trump regime the trump administration had come up with a trump plan vision for peace now in 2000 Ehud Barak and Asir Arafat when they came together and Arafat was give, being given a deal he said no the camp david accords of 2000 in fact failed and Arafat was blamed in a way but uh, Arafat is not exactly the person who should be blamed for it because he came with a set of thoughts and he had told them earlier see if this thing doesn't go through please don't blame me and he had be- earlier before and said I can't accept this, 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 and I can accept this, this, this. And in 2000, the Israeli sides were in talk with Syrians to return the Golan Heights, and they were willing to return all of the Golan Heights almost, leaving a few uh, square miles of land near the Lake Kinneret. But they were not offering the Palestinian side that much leeway. In fact, in 2000, the Palestinian side you are creating Bantu stance, which was like a stretch, but still they had some logic to it. coming to 2020 what the trump administration offered was much less they offered them all these territories and because see in west bank if you see the map on the left or the right all this territory the brown would go to israel so as a compensation the palestinian side would get all these territories along the egyptian border one of them will be having an agricultural park another would be a high tech industrial zone and this is supposed to compensate for all those lands and like in 2000 they had offered a land bridge connecting gaza and west bank again the same has been offered 
and like in 2000 the israeli and americans had said that they would control the coast initially and they might slowly give up the control of the land adjoining jordan river but now they are saying that this land will go to israel entirely for security reasons and there's going to be a small gap you see here connecting jerusalem to the dead sea so this kind of cuts the palestinian territory in west bank but they will get all these roads and all so we what do we see here we see that in the palestinian israeli conflict there are the there's not so much good there is basically bad the ugly and repetition of the old things but we must understand in 48 60s and the 70s the palestinian side was not even willing to acknowledge israel they were fighting for the destruction of israel so we have moved a lot we have made progress uh, today palestinian side agrees that israel has the right to existence and even in 2017 when hamas came out with the revision of its charter they said that okay israel has a right to existence give us a state but then they say that we have the right to destroy that israeli state later on should we feel to fight on with this we come to an end we can uh, we are now open for questions Thank you so much for a, a lengthy, informative, and uh, enriching presentation, uh, Jyoti ji. Now uh, the session is open for question and answer. Uh, so please uh, go ahead. If you have any question, uh, we can take up. OK, uh, I will ask uh, one question to you. Uh, like, uh, it's regarding. Uh, the role that uh, United States uh, have been uh, playing, right, in the Arab-Israeli peace negotiation. So uh, I just wanted to elaborate as to why the United States' role is so indispensable and uh, what exactly its role is. I mean, why United States is so valuable in uh, Israel-Arab uh, you know, negotiations. What's your take on it? Thank you. So before we go ahead, I'd like to let everyone know that in the next lecture, in fact, we'll talk about the wars, the Hezbollah Israel wars, the Lebanon Israel wars, the Yom Kippur war of 73, the surprise attack and the 67 war. But as Dr. Anruddha mentioned, why is US so important? So even in all those wars, the one thing that was able to protect Israel in a way, we'll have to admit was US because in 67, Israel went ahead with the first attack. It destroyed the Egyptian Air Force. It destroyed the Syrian brigades. But in 73, when Israel was under attack from the Arab side, when they took the initiative, the Israelis were almost pinned to the wall. There was nothing left in a way. That's where I mentioned that Moshe Dian said the third temple might be lost. That's when US came in. The Jerusalem airport was like busy for three, four days because US C-17 planes, Indian Air Force has recently got those planes as well, C-17, big transport planes. There was one plane landing, I think every three hours with ammunitions and weapons. So in 50s and 60s, the superpower on which Israel was depending for technology, weapons and everything might have been France. Today, it's very much US. Even today, uh, Israel is able to dominate it has a force of 700 planes. It, ha it is the only Air Force in the Middle East that flies the F-35 and it flies it over Tehran, it flies it over Beirut. And then they take the pictures and then they put them up for propaganda coups. So, and also the Israeli military, it gets almost 3.8 billion to $4 billion every year as aid from US. So US is very relevant for Israel. It is even more relevant for the Palestinian side. Why do we say this? Because the Palestinian side understands that it needs one thing most importantly is recognition. Whose recognition? It's American recognition. Because uh, you might have come across formation of new states or de-recognition of old state, like Taiwan was de-recognized. It is once US de-recognizes you that other countries get an incentive to de-recognize you. Once US recognizes you, other countries get a incentive to recognize you in a way. And also, 
when we are talking about all this road land bridge and all these facilities that we are talking about we are talking about industrial park for palestinian society and all that where is the money going to come from the money is going to come from the americans for any for peace to be possible uh we need money for doing anything this day we need money in all this the one entity that is willing to spend money to ensure peace is united states it is willing to pay for peace so while others might say we want peace united states is the country that can ensure that there is peace and also it can control the levers on all these countries the palestinian authority even today depends on money for its existence it has to pay salaries it has to go at all that and when donald trump said that we'll stop the funding out to pa it was like the world came apart similarly money is a big thing and us no matter what even today is one of the richest countries and it has that wherewithal it has the spending power it can push all that and also when it comes to politics united states has some degree of legitimacy much more than other countries because it has been an actor and in 50s and 60s it was the department of state wasn't exactly a friend of israel so in us if you play your cards well uh us might support you oppose you but there is no ideology that us is against you forever so there is a faith in us in a way you can say a yeah, very interesting that is that is very true you know the, the us is a game changer after all uh, is there any other question uh, okay from abhive uh, yes a simple question to you what is india's stand on the role of peace making between the two countries what's your take i mean israel and uh, you know arab israel issue what is india's stance yeah india's stance yes this is what she wants okay. to know okay just okay so what is india's stance okay so historically india has stood by the palestinian side even today india stands by the right of the palestinian state to come into existence and if you go through the 1970s and 80s when india held the nam conferences uh, during indira gandhi's time we'll see that yasser arafat is present there on the stage with indira gandhi and even today Uh, though in india we don't have a left leaning government anymore and we have a center right government if you may still despite all that uh, india is holding india has kind of retained a connection to the palestinian side but truth be told economic interests of india are more in convergence with israel because not because israel has lot of money or anything or they are going to engage in fdi in india in large numbers not exactly for that reason but with israel india can collaborate and get things that it can't usually get from other countries not just in military but also in other realms as well uh, for instance agriculture development tech development and much of it israel is not a very inventive economy it's a very innovative economy and one of the reasons they have been able to do is this is by freeing up structures israel also has a very messy red tape and a bureaucracy but if you want to start a business uh, you are more than welcome to do so there and india wants to retain that connect in israel and also we have a fledging diamond industry in gujarat and bombay there's a diamond boss in barakula complex in mumbai it is very much connected to the diamond complex in the east of tel aviv there's a diamond boss there as well and you'll see a lot of indian businessmen who are working there so economically you say we are tied to israelis in several ways also for many of our military equipment that india needs those niche equipment we can only get it from israel in a way for instance if you look at the indian navy uh it the latest ships of indian navy they have got the mf star radars multi functional surveillance threat alert radars these are israeli 3d radars now india was not able to get this radar from other countries and israelis were able to offer it at a cheap price again israeli innovativeness they able to offer you something at a much cheaper price now the mig 21s that india has uh israel doesn't have mig 21s but if you want to modify them and upgrade them there are israeli companies who will who are willing to do that for you similarly the jaguar planes that we have for deep penetration strike again modifications you want 
contact the israelis they will come and they'll modify it it doesn't mean that the israelis have all this technology within them they come they try their hand they'll find a way and they'll come up with a solution after hit and trial after a few months of labor if you pose the same question to the palestinian side see israelis have so much to offer to india what do you have to offer the palestinian side is also very correct because the palestinian side says that we are shackled how can a person in shackle help you so much and back in the day uh, during pram mukherjee i think it was india had sent a lot of computers for the students of palestinian universities they got stuck in israel they couldn't reach the palestinian west bank so the palestinian side says see even if we don't our students don't get access to those computers how will they program how will they create software that we could then sell to indian it companies any further that's, questions how that's, that's, you want me to elaborate that's, that's very true uh i think one more question no nothing it came from uh, abhive okay uh, so another question from my side uh, uh jyoti ji just like you i am also a student of uh, security studies and uh, i have often uh, done a comparative analysis of uh, you know how a various intelligence agencies perform okay at uh, various level in various context and uh, since i'm also a student of international law uh, i uh, you know i could not ignore uh, you know the presence of the intelligence agencies and their influence uh, you know over the international community so i just uh, want uh, i'm just curious to understand you know the i mean even our viewers also what is the basic difference between uh, the mossad the shin bet and the aman and how those you know the three agencies the mossad the shin bet and aman they are so coordinated and you know what the world can learn from their coordination and their uh, modus operandi because uh, you know this is something you know par excellence they perform what is your take on it because you are at the ground level ground zero you have experience uh, uh, you know the, uh, the, their functioning you have seen them so what is your take on it so before i start answering this question it's an amazing question and yeah dmi amma okay so first yeah, of all uh, why these agencies have been very successful uh yeah. to be honest uh, they have had their fair share of failures as well uh and if i am to be a little bit less courteous to the israeli side i would say that the enemies that israel has faced of in conventional wars at least not necessarily intelligence they have been less weaker for instance if we compare to the indian example india has had to face with formidable uh, adversaries uh, for instance pakistan is not a, something you can take not seriously pakistan is a very strong enemy israel in 60s and 70s had challenges from egyptians and jordanians but in my assessment israelis came a bit lucky or you could say at times uh, they were innovative and coming back to the intelligence topic so the amman dmi that is on top it is the aggregator of all intelligence it remains on the top and below it you could say there are several intelligence agencies two most famous being mossad and shin bet now mossad is like the external intelligence agency it coordinates with all the foreign governments like all the embassies they have an intelligence attache there you that will be a mossad person so in every israeli embassy anywhere there will be some official either directly from mossad or he is like a liaison from mossad but shin bet it is more like internal intelligence uh, like india's equivalent will be the intelligence bureau and india's equivalent of mossad will be ro america's equivalent will be cia and for shin bet the american equivalent is not exactly fbi but it comes close so shin bet operates in west bank israel gaza even it will operate in jordan when needed it will operate south of litani river in lebanon if needed it will operate on golan heights the region right across the golan heights even in sinai if needed so shinbet is more oriented towards israel and its immediate vicinity mossad on the other hand casts a wider net now israeli intelligence is not high not very high funded the funding is not so high so they have 
certain amount of funding and they have to make the maximum out of it and much of the famous operations that we see in tv series uh, such as fauda uh, they are showing us an in glimpse of uh, shinbet and in the map where i was showing you the operations in west bank that was launched by israel after the second intifada i told you don't uh, look at hebron look at the karam kalkeli and that's where the israeli soldiers went the reason i said so back then was because there was also some intervention in hebron but not by idf it was done by some shinbet operatives who were living like arabs who are so israel has a lot of these units called duftewani units shinbet has it israeli army has it israeli border police has it so these are people who can pretend to be arabs they will get into the street behave like an arab talk like an arab because in palestine a person can hear the way you talk the accent and they can tell which village of which region of west bank or gaza are you from so if you are not a good enough to the wani guy then you'll get caught so these guys have to they actually become like palestinian think like palestinian and they actually do that mossad doesn't engage in such activities in the west bank or gaza that much however if needed it will shinbet not only looks at the arabs it also looks at the israeli society as well the jewish society as well it has a bench a desk an office a group that takes care of extremist jews as well because in 1995 the israeli prime minister isaac rabin was assassinated by a jewish extremist and also there is the case of baruch goldstein between the Oslo 2 and Camp David 2000, who had again attacked the mosque at the in Hebron, the place where all the patriarchs Abraham, Rebecca, Leah, they are all buried there. There's a synagogue, come mosque. It is combined. So Shin Bet also takes care of all kinds of such things. Israel also has a equivalent of India's NTRO and America's NSA. US has the National Security Agency, the All Seeing Eye. and india has got its ntro and uk has got the gchq these are signal intelligence agencies israel has its own it's called unit 8200 but unlike the other countries which have like civilian agencies unit 8200 comes under the military it's a military signal intelligence agency so they have kept the signal intelligence part the cyber intelligence part entirely within the military and this enables them to ensure that the dmi amman stays on top now you might have seen the operation grapes of wrath that i mentioned after the munich massacre the people who are responsible for that when to avenge those deaths they were mossad in most cases also when uh, many of the nazis who had run away to argentina and hidden after world war 2 they had to be caught and brought to justice it was mossad who did all that so mossad today can operate in uganda they can operate in australia they can operate in any far off country not just because they have the mandate but also because they have the ability to to do so one of the ways it has been able to do that is by using the passports of israeli citizens because a lot of israeli citizens have dual citizenship american israeli british israeli french israeli and australian israeli so it can always get a cue of how the passports are changing how what is changing give fake identities but we must understand the difference between an agent and a spy now in the next lecture we'll also be covering about the 1973 war where we can talk about eli cohen and also the angel the angel was the person who had warned israel of the 1973 war now in 1973 war when the yom kippur war took place uh, there was a son in law of nasser who is referred to as the angel he is the one who had given forewarning to israel that an attack is coming attack is coming the israeli side made some mistake with the intelligence and because of which the 1973 surprise attack could take place so the fault again lies with the israeli side but even back then the mossad was pretty sure that an attack is coming it was the dmi which was on top which said that no attack is going to happen so we see that even in their bureaucracy intelligence bureaucracy they don't always get it right there is competition between one club one group of intelligence one intelligence agency and another there is stuff for there as well 
but Mossad somehow gets to be on the top, more powerful, it appears to us because it is directly connected to the prime minister's office. The Mossad chief answers to the prime minister. The military, the Amman intelligence chief has to answer to the military chief, the commander of the IDF, the head of the IDF, which is usually a three-star rank, the equivalent of a lieutenant general. Uh, so the Amman, while structurally it appears on top, Mossad has direct access to the prime minister. Shinbet, on the other hand, gets very little popularity outside. But it is the most instrumental for Israel's security because much of the threat to Israel, in fact, today stems in the nearby areas. It is not very, how do you say, it doesn't come, it is not that kinetic anymore. So Shinbet is important, but increasingly with the rise of Iran and Israel seeing Iran as a threat, we see that Mossad is venturing a lot and Unit 8200 has become even more important. Why Unit 8200 has become more important? Because Israel has used Unit 8200, its assets and agencies and its techniques to counter Iran's nuclear program. To, because Israel, you might remember back in the day, a few years back, Israel was able to sabotage the Iranian nuclear program. It was all made possible with American support, but more importantly due to Unit 8200. Thank you again for this uh, elaborated response. I mean, we are really, you know, enjoying, especially, you know, I believe my students are there. They're really learning something which is very new, right? And now, uh, since there is no question, my last question to you, Protege, is regarding the Israel's uh, policy of targeted killing. Okay. So when we think about uh, the Israel's policy, I mean, the way the Mossad, uh, you know, operators operate, uh, their daredevil stories are coming out in the media. And on the other hand, as an international lawyer, uh, I, I I come out with uh, certain queries, and uh, you know so, something that always confuses me regarding the Israel policy of target killing. Uh, Jyoti ji, you must you must be aware that there is in international law there is a principle of hot pursuit. Okay, especially in the case of uh, you know Uniteration Convention of Law of Sea. If you refer that, you know there is always uh, uh, you know there is a possibility of hot pursuit. Right, you can. Uh, you know, your navy can pursue, uh, you know, enemy vessel, okay, go into your territory and attack it. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, in context of the, you know, Indian, uh, you know, the strategic perspective, uh, we have initiated a surgical strike uh, in Pakistan, right? So somewhere I feel as a lawyer that that is an expansion of the principle of hot pursuit. So what do you think? This is Israel's policy of targeted killing uh, that it has openly advocated is an extension of the principle of the hot pursuit, uh, like uh, running behind the enemy, hunting it down in the interest of uh, the security of the nation. What is your take on it? Uh, could you repeat the last line? I couldn't catch the last line. No, I was just I was just asking you, right? That whether running behind the enemy, pursuing the enemy. Okay, and hitting the target in the interest of the Israel security, right? How is it correct or how is it legal from the international legal perspective? What is the legality in short of the Israel's policy of targeted killing? Okay. Or is, it just, so or, or is it just an expansion of uh, the principle of hot pursuit? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for the amazing question. I would uh, first of all admit my lack of knowledge in legal aspects. But yeah, regarding the Israeli legal aspect, uh, there is something called uh, casus belli in international law. If you have a casus belli, you can go ahead and attack. So even in 1967, when Israel went ahead and attacked Egypt, Israeli explanation was we had a legal casus belli because Egypt had asked the UN to move away from Sinai they were exercising and they had also blocked the Suez Canal and the Straits of Tehran. That was a casus belli for us. We understood they are going to attack. Similarly, when it comes to targeted killing, to say that someone killed our people, then we'll go and kill them. Uh, it's very difficult to justify that in international law. So what instead they are going to say is, we have reason to believe this person is going to kill someone in the future and they will find a way. They will find his next target. 
or find a document and then they will go ahead and kill the future killer before the he or she can kill and then you have a very nice legal case that see he or she was going to kill someone to save a life we have engaged in killing of a terrorist so that makes it very much easy but let's say you don't have that luxury then what do you do then uh, most of these people they have those who are out there to be assassinated they have a long list of crime series they have already that many number of crimes on their head that they can easily go ahead israelis have a case that okay we have we can go ahead and kill them but even if there was no legal case even if there was no legal backing it is very easy to actually justify your killing much later because by the time you make it public 10 20 or 30 years down the line uh, the legal case is not no longer an issue but the more difficult and the more important thing to talk about here might be the assassination of nuclear scientists or experts or senior officers uh, from the adversary because israel has assassinated several nuclear scientists of iran it has even assassinated uh, kasim soleimani in the last few years so how does israel justify all that so here comes what's called the law of proportionality uh, i understand i'm moving away from your hot pursuit answer but i'll speak a few lines on that towards then so the law of proportionality is often misunderstood i would say in international law because it says that okay someone should hit me on my shoulder i should go and hit them on the shoulder now that's not law of proportionality in international law international law instead proportionality usually means that if let's say i know there is a target i have to hit it but there's going to be an associated collateral damage then the collateral damage is it proportional to the value of the target if that is more or less the same then i can go ahead and kill it i am satisfying the law of proportionality but to say that someone fired one bullet and i should fire fire an exact bullet of the same caliber using a similar gun of similar range that's not necessary if someone even fires one missile you have every right to respond using 10 or 100 missiles and hit the target because the aim is to they fired us we have a reason to fire back and we'll fire back but it becomes different case when more people die and all that because there are political implications and when we come to the targeted assassination of scientists israeli perspective is that the value of the scientist is so high because the scientist is enabling the formation or creation of a nuclear weapon and if the nuclear weapon comes into being it can kill hundreds of thousands of people so we can we would say that the death of a scientist is like a collateral to destroy the nuclear program so they will say that one scientist his value is going to now you can't exactly match the human life's value but they will say okay in our uh, measurement we said it is worth killing that one scientist when it came to kasim sulaimani's killing israel didn't say that kasim sulaimani has created militias in iraq he has done so much damage to us he's directing groups in syria against us that's why we killed him that wasn't the argument the argument was kasim sulaimani was going to plan three or four big operations against israel to prevent that we went ahead and we killed him when it comes to hot pursuit in law of sea uh even that has some limitation for instance uh you can pursue them i guess if they are in your uh not the territorial but the ez i think and then you can pursue them further but also in open seas uh today there are a lot of instruments international instruments that enable you to pursue them pursue them but sure. when it comes to pursuing targets terrorists or even high value individuals it's a more a case of capability if you have the capability then you measure uh, the cost benefit analysis okay we do this what comes in return oh i made a small mistake i think i said kasim sulaimani was targeted by israel it was not targeted by israel it was targeted by us so i think i'm if i'm not making a mistake there and in response to the killing of kasim sulaimani iranians bombed a us base all together the haider base in iraq and the americans knew that the missiles are coming so they evacuated a lot of them and no one exactly died but iran was going to hit american targets americans knew that 
so each time israel is go ahead and kill someone they have to take this into consideration what's going to be the response and how you are able to absorb it thank you so much it's it's almost 4:45 now okay almost one and a half hours we have been discussing such a complicated issue yeah absolutely correct i mean uh, i i really endorse your opinion because see when it comes to uh, the preemptive strike uh, okay as you have uh, just mentioned and uh, the principles of hot pursuit uh, principles of hot pursuit definitely it may have uh, its own limitations or okay? so legally we have to take all those uh, you know things into consideration and yes uh, india also has shown its capability that it can tackle pakistan and the pakistani threats okay so from all this angles right so we can finally conclude that uh, israel can teach so many things to all of us right right not only just from the culture from the biblical history its politics but also uh, how it protects its own people from the external aggression so a big lesson to learn and also we learned a lot from you also sir so thank you so much for the time that you gave to all of us and uh, we are eagerly now waiting for the third lecture uh, in this israel series uh, time will be notified and date will be notified to our viewers very soon uh, until then we will patiently wait for that so jyoti ji thank you so much for your time and your knowledge we we'll learn a lot thank you so much thank you thank you so thank much as well but yeah, before we leave all the part to say one thing yes please it is also equally important to learn from israel's mistakes yes yes, yes because uh, next lecture will be discussing the lebanon war i think israel often sees it as its own vietnam the first lebanon war and while israel has done amazing work and we have a lot to learn from it no doubt uh our record is also not that bad and for that matter the record of other countries is also not that bad as you also mentioned that india also went ahead and uh, went ahead with the surgical strikes but uh, how do i say this uh, there is this sherlock holmes novel right the written by arthur conan doyle it talks about the curious case of the dog that did not bark in, <laughs> yes 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 <laughs> in intelligence it's always the case of the dog that did not bark how do you justify that and do you repeat it then because last time the dog did not bark right so can you do it again will the dog not bark this time <laughs> right with this words sir uh, you know we 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 really have to conclude and uh, we are taking away so much from you thank you guys thank you so much thank for joining thank you jyoti ji once again thank you so much thank you so much